move to get the meeting underway here. Everybody's good to go with that. Aye. Aye. Okay. First item of on the agenda. I hope you've all had a chance to take a look at that. Uh, is the approval of the agenda itself. Uh, so is there anything that anybody wants to change, add to it? Hearing no, I move it be approved. A second. Okay. Very good. Agenda approved. On uh, item number two, uh, approval of the previous month's minutes. I did look through that as well. I didn't see any adjustments or changes that were required. Do we have a motion? I'm I'm moved to be approved. A second. Very good. Any of those against? Okay. Previous minutes approved. Uh, communications into agenda item number three and we'll go through the uh the monthly reports at this point in time so who do we have up first from uh, the golf pros sam do you want to go first can you hear me okay yep Hey, Sam. Yep, sure can. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Howdy. It's been Jan since January since we got to see each other. Good to see you all, all right. again. You too. Can't wait for it to be in person. So, yeah, the uh, season was off to a great start. Um, after February, we were $37,000 ahead of um, the prior year. Course got shut down March 16th middle of april we reopened april 23rd at 50 percent then we finally got to 100 percent on june 1st well, at the end of the may we went from uh, being ahead 37,000 to being behind almost 110,000. but one of the uh, bright spots of the uh 2020 is golf golf has experienced an amazing boom um, not just in longmont or Colorado, but across the entire country. I'm sure you guys have probably heard that, but golf is doing great. Um, through year to date, we're now at 187,000 in revenue. Um, rounds were down at the end of May by 3,370. We got up to 128 ahead of prior year at the end of uh, this last month. Um, and it's still going strong year or month to date. We are still on a great track. We're 909 rounds ahead month to date for October. And we are about 51,000 in revenue ahead. So it's going great. 2020 is turning out to be a great year for us. Thank you, any questions? No, no questions here. Anybody? No? no. Fantastic, Sam. Glad, glad to hear it. Thank you. Keith, you want to go next? Hello, everybody. Hi, Keith. Hi, Keith. Sam, Sam got the benefit like. of going first so he could tell everybody all the good news. <laughs> Mingled in with all the bad news of the tough year that everyone's had, so... Uh, to his point, he's exactly right. It was, uh, I've never seen anything like it uh, in terms of how busy the course was and, and, and the regulars were complaining about having to uh, make tea times and they couldn't just walk on. <laughs> so it was, it was amazing. And the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Uh, we're, we're over 30,000 rounds starting into October. We're well over 33,000 rounds now. We were up 1.8% just on the rounds but uh, we're gonna be even up more than that by the end of this month. The revenue is up 13.2%, $110,772 through September. Um, and at last check, I think we were at a million, $1,030,000 through 
through a couple days ago. And uh, I think only one other time have, has Twin Peaks ever actually gone over a million. I think Sam went over a million in 2003 at Twin Peaks, something like that. So it's amazing. Wow. And uh, to, to go, I mean, the statistics are kind of staggering. I mean, we were, at one point, we were down 32% in revenue through May. And, and now we're up 13.2%. And, you know, to make those kind of numbers up in the summer, it just tells you how full we were. We were full from open to close every single day. And it was great. It was really, it was really fun to work at a golf course where we were just packed all the time. And we didn't have to discount the prices at all. Um, we just charged our normal rates and everybody was happy to pay them. And, and uh, you know, we, we moved to uh, some online payment schedule where people can book their tee times online and they use what's called prepaid tee times. And that really helped with the traffic in the building. So we had less people in the building, made it safer for the employees, safer for the golfers. Uh, and that, I don't know what the percentage is on that, but that contributed to a lot of our revenue, obviously, that we didn't have to collect at the front counter. So that went great. That took some doing to get that, uh, that going. You know, props to Jeff on that. And uh, city attorney helped us through that and navigate some of those waters that were kind of difficult to, to get all that squared away to begin with. Um, but it went really well. And, you know, can't say enough about the staffs at all three golf courses, both the maintenance staff and, and our staffs that work inside the building, the BevCard staff, you know, nobody knew what to expect. Everybody was a little nervous. Everybody was a little scared. Um, but we just made it through week after week. We just kept getting it through and the disinfecting of the carts and all the things that we had to do to keep everybody safe was great. And, uh, can't say enough about Jeff Friesner and, and his leadership through this because it was a weird time and we had to communicate a lot more than we would normally have to communicate. And, and he had a lot of other stuff going on and a lot of balls in the air and, and, uh, it was tough. So we managed to work through it all. And I think we're all kind of, ready for a little downtime after the crazy last five months, six months. If you look at the, the numbers, like I said, they're just staggering. Um, you know, I hope, I hope that we all can get out and not have to be masked up and that a vaccine comes and, 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 you know, 21 will look a lot different that next year because we didn't really host a lot of tournaments. Uh, the tournaments that were hosted were hosted by outside events. We didn't do our normal shotgun starts and fundraisers and, and the normal things that we would do, we didn't do this year. So we hope that next year with all this, you know, that we'll have that pent up demand. And then we have all these new golfers because we created a lot of new golfers this year. I've never seen so many golf bags that were, you know, walking up to the building from the 1970s. I mean, I think people were buying golf clubs at, at garage sales and then bringing them out to the golf course. And they had no idea how to play golf. And and yet it still worked really good. I mean, we didn't have a whole lot of issues. We, we, uh, we as a group went to 10 minute intervals on our tee times, which was something that I think we had needed to do for a long time. And, and I think I can speak for all three golf pros and the staffs that we have that worked really, really well. We were always on time on the tee sheet whenever we had any, you know, technology mishaps where somebody thought they booked a tee time and they didn't because of the 10 minute intervals, we were able to get people on. That, that showed up thinking they had a time, never had to turn people away. So that went really good. So we're looking forward to how that plays out in 21 as well. Uh, I think that's about it. If there's any questions, I'd take them at this time. No, it doesn't, doesn't seem like a key. All right. Fantastic. Thanks. Good. Thank good, you good all. Thank you very much. All right, so that would leave Ryan. All right, well, uh, not much to really go after after they uh, after the two of those guys. Um, they kind of took everything that I pretty much had on my plate here to stay. Other than, you know, I, I have to state rounds and revenue. I, I can't agree more that I've never seen the numbers the way they are. Um, the way everything's rolling. Um, the way the staffs have maintained the facilities and just, it's so smooth right now, in my opinion. Um, I mean, yeah, the deficit for 
revenue in rounds, I mean, 35, 38% from when we got shut down uh, and coming back to where we're at now at sunset, about 13% ahead for revenue and uh, roughly two, 3% ahead in rounds. But again, like Keith said, we haven't had any dynamic priced tea times. We've all been rack rate all the way around and it's, <laughs> It's quite amazing, to be honest. So I don't know much more, much more I can say, to be honest. But um, any questions for, for me at Sunset? Um, my only question, Ryan, would be, um, I know, you know, we're coming to the kind of the end of the season here. Um, but is there any chance of opening to 18 whole rounds at Sunset? Or are we going to stick to nines at this point in time? We've been kind of starting to do more 18 hole rounds, but on a, still on a limited basis. And it's based on when you book your time. If you call us, if you book it online and you book the nine hole rate, if you call me in the shop, we'll put, if we have availability, that's the key to the whole situation right now. If there's an availability, we'll put a block in the sheet for a turn time. Um, and then we can charge you the difference between the nine and 18 hole rate. To, to make it that correct rate when you come in. Um, however, online tee times for sunset will always be nine holes because there's no way for the automated system to actually duplicate a, um, a secondary tee time to accommodate for that turn time, being that we're only a nine hole facility. So you'll never see an 18 hole rate online um, unless we build another nine holes. But um, right no, understood. Uh, we, understood. Well, there's a lack of space. <laughs> no. But um, the, I mean, realistically, if you call me or call anyone in the staff in the shop, um, absolutely, we can get you around for an 18 hole time, um, just per the availability right now. Um, I have had to turn away a few people for that instance because of the amount of players that we have, and then occasionally, I, I think I see it more at sunset. Um, than, uh, than, it, than the other guys, maybe at Twin and Mute. But uh, a lot of players will show up maybe a minute to two minutes before their tee time. So the 10 minute intervals help us keep it spaced out. But occasionally there's, uh, you know, the instance where <laughs> we might need that extra couple of minutes there to, to get caught up. But we, we usually are pretty much right on schedule now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I Keith stole my thunder. Also, the they all made it seem easier than it really was. There was a lot of struggle about can or closing the golf courses in March. There was a lot of struggle about trying to reopen in April, and I can't say enough about the the pros, their staff and all the maintenance uh, staff and how they made it safe for everybody to be out on the golf course. And, and to see a year where it was as busy as it was is just amazing, the, the work that they did this year. So my thanks really goes out to them. Yep, yeah, absolutely agree with you. All righty. We can move on to the next agenda item, if everybody's okay there. Uh, I think actually we have public invited to be heard twice on here. So I think I wanna put that towards the end. Well, let, let's just, uh, Susan and Steph, are there, is there anybody that called in? No, we don't have anybody that would like to join the meeting. So there will be nobody for public invited to be heard tonight. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, any old business that we need to address at this point in time? Uh, the old business on the previous minutes uh, really kind of spoke to uh, the facility upgrade and, and maintenance uh, for all the courses, which really kind of gets into item number six uh, yeah. for new so, business. Yeah, just so during the year, because of where we were financially, all of our projects were put on hold. And then in late August, we were given permission to move forward. The only uh, capital um, project that we have working right now 
is that we are doing some pond improvements uh, on banks uh, stabilization out at U Creek. Last week they worked on number eight and in the next two weeks they'll work on 18. Otherwise everything will wait until 2021. So, okay. as, Very good. so as far as new business, uh, Steph, could you put the PowerPoint up, please? So I wanted to talk uh, a little bit tonight about the maintenance uh, facility that uh, the bond project uh, approved in 2018 is paying for. Uh, we have some challenges that are going on with that project, um, in particular with the relocating of the maintenance building from Highway 66 to the clubhouse site is um, have some neighbors that are, are upset about the city's decision to do that. I'm gonna do a quick uh, overview of where we're at and then we would like your feedback on on your thoughts about the Highway 66 site or the clubhouse site. So Steph, if you could go to the next slide. So again, uh, just going through some, some background, uh, the golf course uh, had a conditional use plan approved in 95. The golf course opened in 97 uh, without a, an official maintenance facility. Uh, at the time, uh, they ran out of money, and so the decision was made to use the old farmhouse and property to use as the maintenance facility. In 2002, um, Larry and the staff went through a site plan amendment to move the maintenance building to the clubhouse site. That was approved by the planning department but golf did not have any funds to be able to do that. So that uh, plan amendment has since uh, um, come to an end. And so we're going through that same process right now based on the voters uh, approval of the little, almost $1.5 million for the new maintenance facility. Uh, next slide, please. So this kind of gives you a picture of where we were, the, the current location on your top left is uh, where the existing uh, maintenance takes place at the golf course. And uh, in the bottom left is where we are proposing to build the uh, new course. And then on the, the picture on the right just shows you where those uh, two locations fall on the entire golf property. Next slide. You can, uh, next slide. Yeah. So this gives you kind of a proposed uh, site plan of what we're looking at. Uh, again, this is at the clubhouse location. The uh, office and maintenance building is where the majority of the uh, maintenance work, there'd be three bays in there where our mechanic and staff can work on all of our equipment. There are two offices in there and then also a staff break room and a meeting room. Building just below that, the equipment uh, building is where we would store all of the equipment. Currently, uh, most of the equipment is uh, in uh, a lean-to or just setting out in the open. And then at the, the bottom is uh, material bins so that we can have um, sand and, and dirt and that sort of thing stored in a contained area without a roof so that uh, those materials are, are better accessible than what we have right now. Uh, next slide, slide, please. This is just kind of a, a layout of what that maintenance building uh, uh, could look like. Uh, next slide. Uh, these uh, show a representation of what the uh, maintenance facility uh, could or would look like. One of the things I'll point out in this picture is originally we had proposed that the buildings be uh, 20 feet tall. Uh, they've been dropped down to 18 and we continue to work 
on the possibility of lowering them down even further based on uh, some of the feedback from the neighbors. Next slide. This is the what the look of the storage building uh, would would be. Uh, next slide. This uh, kind of gives you a, a project timeline, and at the end of the at, after tomorrow, we will send the PowerPoint out so that you have this to refer back to. Uh, in in November of 2019, we went to the Development Review Committee. And at that time, uh, there was a number of conditions brought to our attention about the Highway 66 site. Um, some of those uh, things included that uh, our access to Highway 66 was going to be taken away, that uh, with the widening of the highway, we would lose uh, a large portion of access uh, where we could not build on that property. We have to uh, construct a 10 foot wide bike uh, and pedestrian path that currently ends on the west end uh, up by the golf course and we need to build that path so that it would go completely across the golf property. Um, we would have to work on an easement uh, with the property directly to the east of the, the current maintenance building that our access would be back to Sundance Drive instead of being to the highway. And then we would need to do a buyout of our current utility provider, which is Poudre Valley, which would be paying them for one year's worth of power to end our agreement with them and then move to the, um, into with Longmont Power and Communication. Uh, so after that, we made the decision to go back to the clubhouse site, um, as was described in the 2002 process. Um, we went through the uh, development review committee uh, for that site and gave, got received feedback on uh, what would need to be done. In March, as you can imagine, everything was pretty much put on hold as we were starting to figure out what the pandemic meant to golf. In May, uh, we started the process again. The city also hired a special projects uh, uh, supervisor who is now helping us uh, supervise the project. And uh, Sharice Montgomery is uh, that individual and has done an outstanding job of uh, keeping us moving and, and really has more background in construction than what I do as a recreation and golf uh, person. Uh, in uh, June, we conducted the city's first virtual public meeting as was required with the, uh, as a part of the, the process. Uh, that meeting was attended by, I believe it was 11 or 12 of the neighbors representing 11 houses and uh, the, the neighbor or the, the meeting, as you can imagine with the way this meeting is, it's really difficult to develop any rapport during the meeting because in that meeting, um, people that were listening in could see us, but we really couldn't see them. And so there was some real frustration on their part that the staff was really just going through the motions and trying to check a box and uh, really didn't feel like uh, there was a connection and that we were really listening to their uh, feedback. <coughs> Excuse me. In June, we mailed out uh, around 300 uh, notices to homeowners around the golf course. That was everyone that was within a thousand feet of the clubhouse site. Uh, in July, we began uh, receiving comments uh, from further comment from the adjacent residents about uh, their concerns. Um, so what Charisse and I decided was that we would uh, conduct a, a second meeting and we actually held it out at the golf course uh, following uh, social distancing requirements and everybody wearing a mask. It was a much better meeting where 
we could really have some real interaction without some of the hesitations that may come through a virtual meeting. They voiced their uh, opinions about uh, their concerns with the clubhouse or the maintenance building moving to this site. We um, explained uh, the concerns with the Highway 66 site and asked that uh, everybody could compromise that the city would try to do the things we could to to make things better and would ask them to do the same thing. Next Thank slide, you. please. Yes. This is Marsha. I just had two questions. How many people then came to the outside meeting? I believe um, there are 11 people. Oh, that's all. Yes. Wow. And yeah. then on one of the earlier slides, there was a sign that's posted that says future site of the Ute Creek maintenance building. Uh -huh. Where Where is that sign located and how long was that there? Has that, that sign been? is located about in the middle of the proposed uh, maintenance building site and it has been there since 2002. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it's been there a while. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yep. Next slide, please. So uh, we explained to the neighbors, they, one of the things that they required or requested was that we develop a delta between the cost of building at uh, the clubhouse site and the uh, cost for the Highway 66 site. That number was about 214,000 based on where we were. And there's another slide that's coming up that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, in, uh, on August 21st, we submitted our first uh, um, response uh, to for the application. That uh, application was delivered and uh, in early September was deemed insufficient. There were five things on that uh, uh, in our submittal that uh, needed further detail. And uh, we have uh, since uh, resubmitted and that was accepted on uh, September 24th. We did have a third meeting with the neighbors on September 21st at the Highway 66 site. They had requested to, to be able to walk around that site, see the condition of the existing facilities and, uh, and then further talk about the uh, pros and cons of the um, moving to the, the clubhouse site. Um, we have been designated, had a planner designated. Her name is Jesse Stoneberg, who will represent the planning department. Um, everybody had until October 16th, that being uh, residents and other uh, city departments to give comment on our plan. Um, those uh, plans are currently being, our comments are currently being summarized and uh, we will, uh, should receive those sometime this week as far as uh, what uh, shortcomings our submittals might have or further work that we may have to do. Um, we did, uh, as a part of the submittal, we sent a second uh, notification to those same 300 uh, residents so they were aware that they could go online, look at the proposal and submit comments to planning also. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide really kind of shows you that delta between what it would cost to uh, build at the Highway 66 site and the clubhouse site. That number of 400,000 uh, was as far as we got because that number, you know, it was going to cost $400,000 to um, build at that location and it was uh, we were going to spend $400,000 before we started building anything uh, out of the ground and really the budget doesn't allow for that with only being uh, $1,478,000. So we chose at that time to stop that work and move to the other site included in in what else would we would need to do is a transportation plan there needed to be work on a visual corridor so that 
when the Highway 66 is widened, widened to make sure that there isn't anything that would uh, impact uh, the, the view of uh, cars on, on the highway. Uh, next slide, please. So that kind of leads us to where our question is. Uh, I kind of explained some of the issues with the high, Highway 66 site. Uh, the city manager gave clear direction. It was uh, best for us to move to this location. He felt uh, that it was not appropriate to take money from other areas, uh, other projects that were already funded, uh, mainly because um, he didn't believe that it was appropriate to take money from other projects that really had a broader impact to our community than what a maintenance building would have to really only the golfers uh, that uh, would really benefit from that improvement. The, the neighbors, their main issues with us building at this site is uh, the view corridor. So the people, the, the house is located on the east side of pool number six. Uh, they're, they're really concerned that the building will be so tall and so large that it truly impacts their view back to the mountains. Uh, they, the neighbors on Lockmore Drive, which is just to the south of the site, their, their bigger concerns are uh, having to look directly into the maintenance building, the noise, the potential of uh, security lighting in the evening, and uh, really, again, looking at uh, a maintenance operation which they believe would uh, decrease their home values. So what we're asking you this evening is to, for your input on what your thoughts are on, on going to this site and the potential impact that that might have to the neighbors, or do you think it's better to try to come up with more money and go back to the Highway 66 site? So I'm open to questions and feedback at this time. Well, I, I have a couple questions. Okay. Um, is there any possibility, because I, if I recall the maintenance site kind of is a little bit built up. There's like a mound or something. Can it, can it be like lowered in the, in the ground at all? So, we would level the site to the parking lot. It would okay. not go below grade. All the mounds that you see there right now would have to be removed. And then in turn, we would, uh, once the buildings were built, we would add mounds back in there, but they certainly would not be as tall or as high as they are right now. We also are proposing in our submittal that uh, there would be trees and bushes planted on top of those mounds to help try to uh, block some of that view. Okay, I mean, this kind of an issue is, is you know, happens all the time, right? In municipalities where, I mean, we have it kind of in our neighborhood where there's a block of land that people that build a house next to it didn't think it would ever be developed even though um, it's incorporated in the city of Longmont. There's a big for sale sign there. And the reason I asked that about that sign earlier, if that sign has been there for a long time, I mean, those residents kind of have been anticipating a build there for a while, right? Maybe. The sign has been there, but there is a possibility there were multiple homeowners since 2002. Most of those homes were not built at, at that time. They were yeah. uh, mainly in, in the start of the grounds was, was being leveled, foundations were being put in. So I can't guarantee that that sign was seen by everyone, mm. but it was there. Yeah. And one of the, the comments from the neighbors was that it really isn't fair to say you should have known. And, and I would agree with that. Well, my only last comment is that, you know, it's a huge price differential between the facility on 66 versus where you have planned it. And going back to the voters, especially the repercussions from COVID, 
I mean, I, I wouldn't think that it would, in, that citizens would cough up any more money for it. Yeah, and we would not go back to the voters. It would have to be taken from our capital improvement uh, fund and it would take money away from other projects that are currently funded. Jeff, this is Marshall. I've only got one question. Okay. Has anybody gone physically to these neighbors who've complained about the possibility of the building impacting their view of the mountains and done any kind of a line of sight to, to see how bad that really might be, what the impact might be if the building were as designed, built there? Uh, we haven't talked to them individually. What we have done is we did some site testing where we put a 20 foot pole up along next to where that sign is right. and went to various locations on the east side to get a view of what that impact would be. And, you know, that their view is going to be uh, taken away by the building if it is built there. Okay, you answered my question. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Fred, it looked like you were going to raise your hand. Well, that was about the question that I had was uh, the view, whether the building as it came down increased their view enough that it would be uh, not a non issue again. It doesn't lower it long enough, where lower it enough to be able to see the mountains. Mm -hmm. From, from the Sundance area. Yeah. How many houses are affected? Uh, 11, we've heard from 11 homeowners. Well, let me, I don't know why I'm asking, but let's hypothetically, set, let's go ahead and say the, the building is built on that site. Uh, do those 11 homeowners have any legal recourse, what would the implications be if they decide it's there and I don't like it, therefore? Well, they, so our next step in the process is we will go to the Planning and Zoning Commission and present our proposal. Uh, the 11 homeowners and anyone else in the public have the right to come in and give comment Planning and zoning then will make their recommendation. If it is passed, the, the homeowners have the right to appeal to city council and city council would then make a determination on whether they would agree with planning or send us back to uh, uh, design and with that site or going back to the other site. And okay. I, my guess is that anybody can always go to court and and try to stop it also. Okay, thank you. Yep. There, there was a comment yeah. about uh, uh, noise. Uh, the orientation of the building, is anything open to that neighborhood in terms of doors or is it all facing the other it's way? All, it's all inward facing. And uh, really the noise concern is, is about how early we start in the morning. Uh, we can start as early as 5.30, depending on the time of year. S the city code ordinance uh, allows golf to be able to be open that, uh, or to start work that early. Most sound ordinance uh, impacts and, and restricts people uh, from making sound until 7 a.m. But golf and parks operations can are, are not uh, impacted by the seven o'clock requirement. Now, so, do you think the sound is such that it really is going to reach those neighbors? It will, I don't believe it will reach the neighbors over on Sundance. There is a possibility that on Lockmore it would. One of the real advantages of a golf operation is that that's, that's where the maintenance equipment is stored, but they're starting out and immediately going out onto the golf course. So it isn't like they're there for an extended period of time. And uh, Jeff Andreessen, you might help me with this, but 
you know, we're talking three to five minutes where they're getting the equipment out, it's started, and, and again, they go right out onto the golf course. So it's not like they would be there for a significant uh, period of time. So as far as the, our maintenance operations come in, we, we'll get there a little bit before five, like between 5.15 and 5.30. Everybody gets their job assignment and they hop on the machine. They'll pretty much, um, they'll be sitting inside that equipment storage building. They'll fire them up and they'll literally pull them out of the building and head right down to like number one, number two, um, just like we do. Um, we did some sound tests with uh, Charisse and a decibel meter and the ambient noise up at the site up there in the parking lot was like 56 decibels. And uh, we had a couple more running by the practice green and it raised it up to maybe 60, 65 decibels. Um, we did some other readings from uh, 200 feet out, 100 feet out. And as we got closer, the decibel readings weren't that noticeable, but until we got within uh, like, I think 50 feet of the machinery, and then they raised it up to maybe 70 decibels. But the amount of time that they're gonna spend and get like to pull out is uh, minimal. Um, as far as the equipment being worked on, it's all done inside because with the uh, Stormwater Protection Act, we're not allowed to work on machinery outside on hard surfaces. It all has to be done indoor where we can contain um, any fluids that might come out of a machine. Um, I really, you know, it's not, our noise impact is gonna be minimal. I mean, I'm not going to deny it will be there because you're going to have, like on a Monday, you'll have probably six, nine machines pulling out in the morning within five, ten minutes of each other. But they're out and they're gone onto the golf course. So I don't think it's going to be as big of an impact as they think it is. But I work with the stuff every day, and so I'm, I'm kind of used to it. I think the bigger impact would maybe might be the lighting and but even that isn't as bright in the newer buildings and stuff because all the light has to point down. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll follow all of the uh, code to, uh, for lighting. There will be no yard lights, you know, the tall, on tall poles. It will be all uh, more security to protect the, the building from anyone getting, getting in. So yeah. there will be no light like you might see out at the Highway 66 site. So it really sounds like the whole thing, it boils down more to the view blockage. Exactly, yes. Yeah. They, there were comments also about increased traffic on uh, U Creek Drive. Um, we believe the number of deliveries will be, uh, I think we estimated one, one to three, was it a, a month, Jeff, is that right? where sand and topsoil and that sort of thing is being delivered? Um, I talked to Sharice today. I had 11 uh, tickets. We probably got 15, maybe 16 loads of sand in. Um, there'll be days like in the, um, oh, I would say like when we're doing airification or, or projects, we might bring in two or three um, end dumps which are semi-trucks, essentially, of sand, and then we use them. Um, but normally, once the, the summer gets going, we might go through a truckload a month, or um, depending on how much we're top dressing, what kind of maintenance we're doing. Um, as far as other deliveries go, you know, I generally get fertilizer drop delivered twice a year. Um, that's pretty much what I want to store. Um, we'll get uh, FedEx, UPS almost daily, um, just because most of our the way the world works now, most everything's delivered, or they don't have stuff in the warehouses in Denver, so it has to get shipped from the, the factories overnight. And that's just how it is. So we get a lot of deliveries like that. Um, we get fuel deliveries like every 14 days during the season. I don't think it's going to be that big of impact. The other will be a little bit, but if you notice in that one picture that he's showing you of the uh, of the clubhouse site, in the corner of that parking lot with a pile of sand, um, or you can see in the corner of that parking lot in the upper, uh, it would be the southeast corner. So we've been taking sand up there, like for top dressing, and we've been dumping it in the parking lot. 
or when we were doing the bunker renovations, when we uh, added all sand to the um, green side bunkers, we were staging a lot of our sand there because it was just, it's more centrally located um, to do it. So I don't, it's not gonna be a big increase. Yeah, there'll be a few more trucks, maybe 15 more end dumps that they would normally not see, but um, I don't think that's gonna be that big of an impact. Um, the other thing about one, one thing, so we talk about where we dump sand in the parking lot because it's more of a central location. For example, to get from our maintenance shop and get out to like 13 green, that's over a two mile drive. Um, because I've GPSed it. So efficient wise, this site makes more sense for maintenance as far as being more efficient with how we do our stuff. Um, but anything's better than what we have now, but that would be the ideal site. So if you have any more questions, I'll feel free to answer. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? I, go ahead. Yeah, Marshall, go ahead. let me just ask one real quick. Discussing the proposed site, what would you like the advisory board to do this evening and in response to the to the site issues? I mean, do you want to vote? Do you want an opinion? What would you like for us to do? I would like you to, someone to make a motion on your preferred site and so that uh, we can share that with the city manager and um, planning staff as, as that's needed. Okay, so asking for a motion. Uh, first we'll motion on the current location. Uh, so yeah, yeah, Earl, if we could just do one motion that yeah. says okay. prefer X as our site, whichever you all prefer. Okay. I'll make a motion that we do the new site next to the clubhouse. I'll second it. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Ask all for those against? Yeah. Moved and seconded. John, did you vote? You're muted. John, you're muted. Uh, no, I didn't vote because I feel totally incompetent to be able to ask <clears throat> to vote one way or the other. This is my first meeting with this, the first thing I've heard about it. Uh, and I, I have no way do I have any opinion one way or the other. Okay, fair enough. So is that Five zero then, is that what you saw? Uh, five zero, yep, uh, Tim. Thanks, um, I, I, it's been helpful to me to listen to the conversation. It's not like I haven't been in it with Jeff, um, you know, prior to tonight. Um, uh, it, so, you know, I, I will report if, if when the time comes to the council, I'm certain Jeff will as well. Uh, the result of the deliberation, your deliberation and, and your recommendation. Um, uh, I'd be happy to carry another message along with your with your motion if you were wanted to entertain something that would also encourage the city council to seriously consider in the 2022 budget use of public improvement funds to finish the clubhouse at Ute Creek. If you're ever going to make that recommendation, this would be a good time to do it. In the CIP, I believe we have about $2.3 million as our estimated budget to expand the clubhouse, just for reference. Yeah, it's on, the, it's on a list of projects unfunded. Yeah. And um, since we are dealing with that, the issue now of the clubhouse, if I were you, I wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to signal the, the, the city council, even as you're supporting this, this um, this plan, um, what your interests are and aspirations are for finishing out that clubhouse. The 2021 budget is built or is done. Um, 
Uh, so there won't be any more consideration. We're gonna prove that actually we start the ordinances tomorrow night. Um, but the building of the 2022 budget will begin very soon. Mm -hmm. And it's not unusual for capital improvement projects, regardless of the funding source, in this case, it would be likely public improvement funding. It's not unusual for those to be to take years to get funded to the point where you can actually contract for a project. It may take two or three years. But if you don't get started, you never get there. And so far, it hasn't been started. Yep. So just for your information as members of the golf committee, if that's something you would like to see, somebody has to make that an issue. <laughs> I will. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be fun to hear from the golf committee as well. Yeah, do we, uh, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. That's, that's good information. I, I didn't realize uh, we were at that point. Uh, I think, you know, for myself, I've always looked uh, for the improvements to be done on the clubhouse at U Creek. Uh, I, I know Sam uh, has asked for that as well in previous years. Uh, does somebody want to make a motion for that recommendation for Tim to take that forward? I move to uh, press that forward. Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to make a motion to uh, to have Councilman Waters bring that up. I will second that motion. Marshall. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Here's what I'll do, folks. I, I, I keep a list of budget priorities that I hear that I learn about during the year. I present those to uh, Harold uh, every year. This will go to the top of my list now. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank Excellent. you. I appreciate you bringing that up. All right, Jeff, anything else on uh, capital improvement? Nope, that's it. All right. Uh, on to agenda item seven. Any items from the staff that we haven't already addressed? Yep, I think we've talked about them all. Great, great. Uh, any other additional items from the board? This is agenda item number eight. Yes, Fred, go ahead. I just wanted to take the opportunity since I'll be leaving the board this year to thank Jeff and the city for the opportunity uh, to serve on the board. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you, Fred. Appreciate all, all your work. Yep, definitely appreciate your your help here. Uh, John, you were raising your hand? Yeah, I've, I've had several people ask me at the golf course, why won't they allow us to drive the carts out into the parking lot? Anybody have any reasons what that, what's that all about? Well, part of it, it's twofold. With the busyness that we've had of at the golf course, it would take too long to be able to get the golf carts back, disinfected, allowed to dry, and be able to get them back out of there. So that is a one of the biggest reasons for that. Uh, secondly, is uh, we were having a large issue with people bringing their own alcohol onto the course. Oh, geez. That uh, puts all three of the golf pros at risk because even though somebody may have their own alcohol, drink it, become intoxicated, it still comes back onto the golf pros. So that, that's really why we're not doing that. And, and part of the issue was when we were closed, people continued to golf and they were bringing their own alcohol out there and um, we ended up having to start monitoring the golf courses and asking people to leave. And, but that, that's the reason why that's not happening right now. Thank you. Yep. Any other items from any of the board members? Well, all right. And as we indicated earlier, uh, no public and, uh, is to be heard at this point in time, unless somebody else has joined in. Yeah, and I don't think if they were gonna participate, they had to join at the, the beginning. All right. Okay, very good. Very good. If there's no other items, um, can we get a motion for adjournment? I will move we adjourn, Marshall. 
I'll second. Second. Very good, folks. We are adjourned. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, uh, everybody. Right. Appreciate yeah. your time here this evening. Yep. Thanks, everybody. It's good seeing you. Good Thank you. you. you Have a well. good night. You as well. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. See you, Keith. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.